Our scripture reading today is Matthew 10, verses 32 through 39. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge them before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of our Lord. That's tough stuff, Mr. Paul. You sure you, you sure that was in the Bible? You weren't just making that up, were you? Um, we're going to get to that, um, but something I forgot a little earlier and I want to make sure that you knew. If you have a prayer request today, if something is weighing on your heart or you got something going on in your family or you're concerned about something that's happening in the world, then I'd love to hear about that. Actually, text it to me now because after the sermon, a little bit later on the service, I'm going to pray, and we're going to pray together for other people, and we'd love to include those. So just um, use the text. There's the number right there, and uh, let me know uh, what those are. You can do that right now. You can do it during the sermon. Um, just don't then go and check your Facebook page and Instagram and stuff like that to give you back your attention <laughs> after you do that. Each Sunday uh, for the next five weeks, we are going to be looking at some of the most misunderstood and controversial passages in the Bible, because why not? I'm just a glutton for punishment, and, uh, but yet I think that um, sometimes these toughest verses or these verses that generate the most controversy, if we can kind of power through that, we can actually get to some insights that are really, really important for our lives and what we're trying to do as a church. So I'm, I'm hoping this is going to be a positive for us. And the very, f uh, so here's the list that we're going to be um, doing. Ooh, oh my goodness. Not peace, but a sword. That's today. Slaves, obey your masters. Ooh, ooh. Hey, women should remain silent. Yeek. <laughs> Ask for anything. This is Jesus. Ask for anything and I will do it. Really? Really? Is that a promise? And then spare the rod, spoil the child. I'm looking at you, child. Spare the rod, spoil the child, go to jail. Yeah, that's how that. So yeah, those are, those are good, huh? So the first one, not peace but a sword, I just found so interesting so if you follow along in your Bible, this is in Matthew chapter 10, so you can come along with us and read it yourself. Um, and there's one phrase, of course, that, that stands out to me, and that's when Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And I just thought, if you took that out of context... Right? If you just had that verse from Jesus and nothing else, you'd have a picture of this outlaw, vigilante, tough guy, Jesus. Um, it'd be like Clint Eastwood, like, I come not to bring peace, but a sword. And, and of course, I'm thinking of the commando, Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I was just curious. Does anybody feel like they have a really good Arnold Schwarzenegger impression? Anybody? I mean, and, and you're so confident in it, you'd love to share it with us, like right now. Anybody got that boldness? Anybody? Oh, come on. All right, I'll do mine. Can you put the words back up there from the previous verse? Okay, here it is. 
I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Nobody? Nobody wants to try? Nobody? Paul? No? You've done enough. Okay. I'm going to ask you again in coming weeks, so you better be, you better be ready. Boys and girls, <laughs> this is why we don't take Scripture passage out of context. This is why we don't just lift up verses and use them to prove whatever point, because the, we can do that. It's, the Bible totally can be used in that way, but it's not the way that the Bible is supposed to be used. We, as Christians, are supposed to be responsible we have been given the word. It dwells in our hearts. God has been so gracious to us in giving us the word that we need to study it, not just take it at face value. And we do that, my friends, we do that by looking at the verse within the context of it happening in Scripture. What is the moment? What is the occasion? Who's Jesus talking to? What's going on in the broader context? We need to know that. We also need to know how this verse works within the overall flow of the Gospel of Matthew, which is the Gospel that we're looking at today. How does it work in that flow? How does it fit in? And then we want to compare it to what God says in other parts of the Bible. So we're going to do that. But First, I need to point out, though, that this verse, I come not to bring peace, but a sword, does speak to a tension that we as Christians have to deal with. We believe, because the Scripture says so, that Jesus is the Prince of, Prince of Peace. And he says over and over again, I have come to bring peace on earth, a peace that surpasses understanding, not as the world gives, do I give. I have come to bring peace. That is who Jesus is. That is, that is the core of Jesus' message. However, we also know, because our symbol of Christians is a cross, right, that that message of peace was not met with open arms by everyone. We know that Jesus, in bringing this message, he was threatened. People tried to intimidate him. They tried to bully him. We know that when that didn't succeed, and they couldn't silence his message that way, they went violent. We know this. We know that he was arrested. We know he was beaten. We know he, he was tortured. We know that he was crucified painful, painful death. We know these things. So there is a tension, and, and the question is, the fact that this good news is going to be opposed, what's our role? Because, man, I don't know about you, I want to take up the sword and fight for Jesus. And I see the passage like this, I've come to bring peace, not a sword. And I'm going, Jesus, I'm with you. I'm going, to be, I'm going to fighting people off with you. My question to you is this. If you could draw your sword on anyone right now, who would it be? What would it be if God just said, draw your sword and fight for me? Who would you want to draw your sword on? I can tell you mine. I'll just be honest with you. I can tell you mine, I would draw my sword on self-righteous Christians, judgy Christians who just completely ignore the gospel of grace and are all about legalism, and they ostracize and reject people. It's done, they have done such damage, in my view, to the work of the gospel, the work that we are trying to, I've given my life to try to do, and to see it all crumble because of a judgy Christian taking a public, making a public comment, and I just want to draw my sword and go, Phew. and the question is, am I allowed to do that? Because the passage kind of is a little confusing, isn't it? I've come not to bring peace, but a sword. We're following Jesus. Do we take up a sword too? Let's talk a little bit about swords. Some of you are going to be really excited about talking about swords. Um, this is probably the sword that Jesus would have known, that people in those days would have known. It's a little stubbier, a little shorter than 
the, the long sword we associate with like knights in medieval times. Uh, this was a lightweight, very easy to use, two, two cutting edges, and this, this was the main weapon of the Roman soldiers at the time. This is, this is what they carried. And so when Jesus is talking about a sword, he's probably talking about a sword like this. Now we ask the question, do we have in the Bible any instance, any mention of God ever carrying one of these? Is there any mention at all of God actually having and wielding a sword? I did a little research and I couldn't find anything. Now... To be clear, I did find a couple of examples of angelic beings carrying a sword. Um, Servants of God. Like, for instance, in um, the Garden of Eden story in Genesis, it says, there's that that top verse there. It says that uh, he placed uh, a cherubim with a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way. Then um, this second example comes from the book of Joshua, and this is right before the battle of Jericho, when Joshua is confronted in the middle of the night with this being who is carrying a sword. But we don't really have any instances in the Bible that I found of God himself saying that he himself wields a a sword other than Jesus saying it this one time. There are examples of God wanting to do something with swords. And it says in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, that he's wanting to take swords and beat them into plowshares. He wants to transform them from weapons of mass destruction into something that's building up and nourishing and and encouraging the people of God. There is an example in the book of Revelation of Jesus, um, and it's a fantastic kind of imagery where it says that Jesus has a sword, a two-edged sword that's literally coming out of his mouth. And I, I just think about that. If that actually happened, that'd be murder on Jesus' lips. I just think that wouldn't have worked very well. Can you imagine somebody with a sword coming out of their mouth? Just... Put it in their hands, their mouth. doesn't seem to work very well. How do they eat, right? I guess they have no trouble cutting sticks. But clearly what this is being, what's talking about here is it's about what's coming out of Jesus' mouth, which is his teaching, right? His word. That's, that's what cuts people sometimes. That's what can cause division sometimes. Are there any examples of God telling people to take up a sword on his behalf? Do we have examples of that? One classic that comes to my head is from the Gospels, the story of Jesus in the garden. And he has just been arrested by the guards who have come to take him to the high priest. And one of the disciples takes out a sword, and he wounds one of the guards trying to protect Jesus. Does Jesus celebrate this? Does Jesus say, thank you? Why aren't the rest of you taking out your swords? What does he say? Next verse, please. Put your sword away. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. In another place, in Ephesians and some other places in the New Testament, there is an encouragement for Christians to put on the armor, the the, the spiritual armor, the armor of God. And part of that is having a sword. So there you go, Christians having a sword. But if you read that, it's clear that the sword is a Bible, not an actual sword. It is the word of God, which is a word of truth, which we know sometimes cuts. So what's coming out of this broader look beyond this verse is that God is capable of fighting his own battles in his own way. And we, and we don't have to defend God. However, there are battles There will be battles. 
And we need to be prepared for that. What do we do? What do we do? Um, I think the rest of this verse goes on to, to tell us what it is that we're up against as Christians. Um, in the first few verses of this passage in Matthew chapter 10, if you don't mind going to the next uh, slide there for me, if you take a look at that, um, we are seeing uh, that there's going to be opposition from the general public towards Christians and towards the, the gospel, the good news of peace that God is bringing through Jesus. That, that's going to be too much for some people. And we know that there are places in the world, even today, where if you say that you are following Jesus, you have just sentenced yourself to death. We know that there's places like that in the world. But, but even here in the United States, I think there's a difference between those who are nice, polite churchians and those who are making a stand for Jesus Christ. One is perfectly acceptable and fine. The other one is like, ooh, kind of radical, aren't you? Proclaiming good news in public can be met with intimidation. It can be met with um, chastisement. It can be met with dis violent disagreement um, and labeling. You know, you're just a judgmental Christian. You're just a bigoted Christian. You're just an intolerant Christian. Um, also, it says in the next set of verses, what happens uh, in our own families sometimes by those who say that they are Christian. Unfortunately, it can cause divisions in one's own household. It says, for I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother. It isn't that we're deliberately trying to break up families, but the gospel can be a dividing line in families. We know that there are places in the world where the values of the culture are totally enmeshed with the identity as a family. And, and if as a family member you, you go outside that, like for instance proclaiming that you're a follower of another religion, than the dominant religion, we know that people face uh, derision and even being ostracized, being kicked out of their family. But friends, similar things happen here in the States, here in our own lives. What I'm interested in, as you look through this set of verses and all the family relationships that Jesus says going to get affected, there's one that's missing. And I find this very interesting. What's the one that's missing? Spouses. It's not mentioned, which I find curious. I have no answer for this. My experience is that that's where the rub can be most acute. When there's a married couple, they're going along, and one of them gets touched by the gospel, and they say, I'm going to follow Jesus from here on out, and the other one does not. And I know there are people in this church who have have had to negotiate that in their marriage. And it's so hard. There's a desire, I wish we were following Jesus together, and it's not happening. The other person is just not ready. So I know that this causes division in families. I have counseled people. I have talked to people. It is painful, and it is real. And Jesus says, that's, that's part of what it means to follow me. But most importantly, towards the end of this passage, he says that there is going, the, the, the gospel is going to cause division within yourself, within your own heart. There will be a sword which will ask you, what's, you will ask yourself, what side do I stand on? Do I, do, am I more interested in fitting in and not causing any kind of stir in my friend groups? or in my workplace, or with my neighbors, or with my classmates, or with the people I play softball with, or the people that I go knitting with, or with the girls that I go and get a glass of wine with? Am I, am, am I going to cause a rub? I better keep my faith to myself. I, I don't want people to know that I am a committed Christian. 
Or are you going to say, this is who I am. I can't not live that in front of people, and they're just going to have to deal with me. I'm going to deal with them in love. I'm not going to take a sword out and run them through. But I am going to admit that that's, that's a tension. That's, that's a decision that I'm going to have to make. That's a conflict that's going on in my life. Jesus says that opposition will come from in you. Taking up your cross doesn't mean that you will be crucified yourself, I hope. But it does mean that you will follow Jesus anywhere. You will follow willingness in his footsteps, even if that faces misunderstanding and opposition. There is a um, summation of the whole message of Christianity that I have seen on several occasions. It's very challenging. It's just three words. This is it. This is, this is summing up Christianity in three words. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. If you believe that, then that means that Jesus is your Lord. And that means that, that you have made it your mission, your life's purpose to follow Jesus wherever he goes in the world. To do the things and join in the things that Jesus is doing in the world, bringing peace and transformation and redemption, even though that's going to be posed, opposed, even though it's going to be threatening. It also means, that statement, Jesus is Lord, also means that Jesus is Lord of all things. And so when we decide to follow Jesus, we are now taking on Jesus' mission to all things, to the whole earth, to bring peace. You can't do that bottling up your faith and keeping it to yourself. You must live your faith actively so you can join Jesus in that incredible mission. Knowing that, some people are going to welcome it with open arms, but some will avoid it like the plague, and they will attack those who are bringing that good news to them. The question is, when we do that, will we have a divided heart? Are we a heart that has been made whole by the statement, Jesus is Lord? And so today and throughout this series, I'm going to challenge you to make some declarations. Now, this is optional. This is not mandatory. If you don't feel led to do this, don't do it. I'm not going to ask you to stand or anything like that or raise your hand, but I do think it's important in our lives as Christians to go ahead and say things out loud that we believe. And so I would give to you this statement. Take a look at that. I will place my commitment to Christ above any other, and I will let that commitment create a heart of love in me. If that's you, if that's your commitment, it's my commitment. I'm going to, right now, I'm going to say it out loud. And I'm amplified, so. Uh, and if you'd like to join me, please do. I will place my commitment to Christ above any other. And I will let that commitment create a heart of love in me. Amen.